Um, hi, Klaus. I want to talk about uh, Activity 4, uh, and this is the Activity 4 video, and we're really just focusing on uh, fractals uh, for the most part of it, and a few little other things uh, that link to the discussion on fractals. And, um, the first thing I want to look at here is uh, this idea of recursion. And uh, for something to be truly uh, a model uh, of a fractal, then um, we have to understand the idea of recursion. And so uh, and so I'm going to bring this, uh, let me just um, get this in here. Okay, so um, let's take a look at this. It, um, uh, recursion is a general term, and um, it applies to a lot of things. And it says it's used in a variety of disciplines, ranging from linguistics to logic. But we want to focus on the idea here of it says the most common application is in mathematics and computer science. So it's a, a function. And so we have this input and output in, in functions. We have this idea of you plug something in, and uh, we usually call that like the, the domain. Those are the inputs into the function. And then uh, the outputs, you know, we would call them like the range and so on. And recursion, it says, is defined within its own definition. Okay, so, um, but what that means is, you know, we're going to have inputs into this function, and then we'll get an output, okay? But then that output, we're going to turn around and take that and plug it back in to the function. So it becomes an input, and then it goes in, and we do something to it, and we get an output, and it's a different value, and then we take that, and we plug it back in. So this kind of goes on and on and on infinitely, and it says, well, it apparently defines an infinite number of instances or function values and often done in a way that no infinite loop or chain, you know, preferences can occur. So, um, so basically, uh, I just want to give you an idea, a uh, simple idea, you know, something that we've already talked about in the course. And um, so I'm going to um, put this down for a minute and I want to look at it. it says here number two give an example of recursion in mathematics and if you remember uh, when we were talking about golden proportions we talked about the Fibonacci sequence Fibonacci sequence right. and we started with a number uh, you can start at zero or one. And then we took these two numbers and we added them together. So there was our mathematical function, right? We, we addition. And we added these two to get one. And then we took and we took two previous values here and added those together. So this gave us two. And there's my answer. So we took the answer plugged it into the previous number, the previous answer, and then we added those two together, and we got three, and then five, and so on. So we were using the outputs to um, plug back in for inputs and so on. So this Fibonacci sequence really is a um, iterative function, you know, something that kind of goes on, you know, infinitely. All right, so... Uh, let me go ahead and uh, put that down, and let's let's go back to the activity, and um, let's look at a, a classroom assignment one, and it says define a recursive process. All right, explain the process, the starting point, and draw at least five iterations. Now, we're going to do this with a uh, program. And 
I've got the link here, so we're going to go into it, and this runs, you know, off the web. So I'm going to take and plug that in, and here, and uh, this idea of spiral ladders. We're going to see how this relates to um, fractals. So we have this idea of recursion of something that is kind of generating from itself you know it's repeating over and over and over again and, and spiral laterals are uh, geometric figures formed by repetition of a simple rule so we're trying to build a foundation and, and it really does there's a, there's several components of fractal images and so i want to look at each one of those and then kind of put them all together because it is a complex idea it's far from a simple idea but it, it's an incredible link between uh, math and art and you can generate you know incredible types of artworks that cannot be really generated without the use of uh, fractals and so uh, so here's let's take a look at this it says for example consider a three segment 90 degree process so this has uh, one line going this way and then a line going this way and of course a line going this way. So we take this, right? This, it goes three, it gets smaller and gets smaller. So that's gonna be our building block in a sense. And then we just take this and then we change position. So that's important. Now this shape here, it's the exact same shape that we have here. Okay, but it's rotated 90 degrees. So we take, we rotate it, now it's going this way, right? And then we take and we rotate that again, 90 degrees, and you'll see it's the same thing that we started with here. And it gets rotated, and it gets rotated one more time, 90 degrees. And then we come up with this image, right? So a very simple idea. Now here is a, a, a little program that you're to kind of mess around with for activity one or assignment one. Um, and I'm gonna, this again was three segments, 90 degrees. So if I take this, I'm gonna back this seg number of segments to three and angle, was it 60? I'm gonna change that. And you see how much it changes. Okay, there. So this, uh, again, is what we had up here. And we can draw one, right? And there's one of those segments. We can animate one. And then we can animate those cycles. And there'll be four of them. And this thing, we had four cycle, four rotations of 90 degrees with that. And what we call is it's closed. So you see that it just kind of all is all closed off, not one around and all fit together. And so, um, and so it's kind of a neat program. And, and you can um, play around with it until you maybe come up with a nice shape. Now I can change the number of segments. So if we had four segments, which I'll draw one, which looked like this, one, two, three, four, and kept it at 90. I can animate that one or animate the cycles and uh, it would look like this. Um, now it's unclosed because you notice here's what starts up here and then it ends, it's not closed off. And um, we could uh, continue uh, drawing these and see maybe it would never close. Now I can um, change this. Let's change this segment to five. And you'll see that after four cycles of 90, again, it closed off. It's a little different than the original one up here. And, uh, you know, you can figure some kind of patterns. You know, if I went to six, all right, it closes after two cycles. And then maybe there's after four. So, and so on. So I can keep increasing. Now that didn't work. Eight didn't work. Right, four and eight didn't work. All right, nine, ten, eleven, 
And then now when I go to 12, uh, it didn't close, right? It's unclosed. So it seems like 4, 8, 12, 16, whatever, we get this unclosed object. The other ones, if I go to 15 or 13, in that case, it closed and so on. So it's a pretty neat uh, way to generate maybe a structured kind of approach. Uh, and then let's look at the angles. Uh, let's change the angle a little bit. And I went to 92 degrees. It took 45 cycles for that thing to close. Let's try to find something that closes a little faster. 15 cycles. If I draw one, there's four segments. Animate that one. And if I animate my cycles, we'll see how that thing's putting together. It's rotating at 96 degrees, right? It's turning 96 degrees from where it stops and starts and, and goes around and creates a nice shape. And again, we can get all kind of really neat shapes by changing. And again, just very simple. But the idea here is that, again, we're repeating something simple over and over and over again, and we're changing its position, but we're maintaining the change. Um, and you can do curved lines, you know, on this, make a little fancier and so on, and, and again, animate those. So, so this is kind of like a fractal idea where you have this thing that it, it looks exactly the same, or uh, in our case, that's gonna, that idea is going to be changing to what we call a self-similarity and it's going to continue on and we're not going to be we're too worried about the closing but this one's kind of nice so so let's go back uh, to this and there's a picture here uh, and we have some artists nowadays uh, that and let me just get that up here. You know, play with these for cursive types of functions. So here's one example. This was a um, author, Martin O'Leary, and he exploring some ideas about recursions of simple geometric forms. So he's looking at it in terms from an architectural standpoint. And um, Here's another one, uh, program. Uh, and this is, so like a fractal machine, but this is more based off the idea of generating hand-drawn types of fractals. So uh, let me just, you know, kind of, you know, say that some people call things fractals, they're kind of really not, uh, but they're fractal-like, okay? So we're building towards that. So what this is, is this throws another idea in. So if I uh, increase this uh, and get the angle, we can change. And the skewness, you can kind of change on there. And I'm going to, you know, you can change the shape until you can change that. Now, what I'm doing is I'm clicking and it's repeating that process and the things are getting smaller. And then I have this kind of shape. So and it's saying basically we could kind of do this off to infinity, right? Now, not with this program, but theoretically, we could keep going smaller and smaller. So this is very much fractal like we start with something and um, let me reset that. And then we create uh, smaller versions of what originally we had there. So we had like this shape to start with, and then we put in some more versions of it here, and then I'll hit it again, and then it puts that same exact shape in on all the lines that were in there, okay? Now, this idea of starting kind of with a larger, simple shape and then creating self-similar shapes just remember in geometry when you had similar triangles those were triangles 
that looked exactly the same, but one was like bigger than the other. And what made them similar from a geometric standpoint was that the angle, angle, angle theorem existed. All the interior angles of the triangles were equal, but the sizes could be different. So that constituted similar figures. And basically the same idea here is that these angles stay the same, but the shapes, right? They look exactly the same, but now we're creating littler ones, smaller and smaller. And again, so, so we got three ideas here now with fractals, you know, to be able to generate those, right? So we're kind of getting there and there's so on. Uh, and what's kind of nice about this is uh, this program, as you can animate this, and then you can also do the trails, which create a very neat pattern. Okay. So, and again, that, okay, that is not helping my pattern. Let's look at it. And you can play around and create different trails, uh, reset. Uh, let me just do a random start and do trails. Let's see. Okay. No, 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 let me do the trails. Okay. So reset this. There we go. And so, and again, you know, if you see something like this and you think about it for a project, you know, I come up with some pretty neat stuff. And maybe that's too much now. You know, we, and you can always reset and play around. So, so if you want to uh, create something, uh, you can use this for your, for an idea for a project. So again, very mathematical, simple line designs uh, using a, a structured process on how the position and the size and the angles, uh, you know, go from one step to this, this recursive idea um, and so on. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and move on. And this next example here, I'm not going to bring up. You guys can look at this one, but uh, again, this is just another application of using recursion and also uh, this idea of this. Some of you probably heard of the Scratch program. And it, it's kind of like the same thing where you change angle, change position, you can change size and so on to create images. All right, so fractals. Let's go ahead and, and now finally talk about uh, fractals. And so if we define fractals, And it says in mathematics, and that's what we're focusing on again, you know, a fractal is a self-similar. So we just kind of talked about that when we say self-similar. Now, remember this here too, that this is not always true. Okay, and, I, and I'll, we'll talk again more about it. But so it says a fractal is a self-similar subset of Euclidean space. And then it talks about fractal dimensions. Now, fractals exist in between the first and second dimension. A fractal does not follow all the rules for the first dimension and does not follow all the rules for the second dimension, but somewhere in between. And so that's one of the reasons that they say that the name came to be, that fractal stands for fractional dimension. Okay, uh, figures. So they are geometric figures, right? But they're not like any other geometric figures 
uh, that we you know usually talk about. Okay. Now uh, the um, let me change go back here. All right, so so it says define fractals, and, and again you don't have to go in depth on this. Again, it's just fractals are geometric shapes that exist between the first and second dimension. Sometimes people would have, you know, identified fractals with the fourth dimension. We talked a lot about the fourth dimension, and it was believed that they really were um, an insight into what a fourth dimension would look like. So, but we're, we're not uh, really going to investigate that. We're just going to continue to try to build on the idea of what what it really is. Uh, so the um, fractal often has the following features. So we said recursive process, right? Something that repeats. Um, it has usually self-similar or near-similar shapes. Uh, it goes off uh, infinitely and it goes smaller so it starts images start larger and usually um, decrease in size proportionally they maintain a certain proportion uh, have a random placement and again have um, fractional dimension okay now it says here i talked about this the fourth dimension home of the complex numbers and fractal geometry and fractal dimensions again gaps or intervals between the other dimensions so all right so again what fract what dimension is a fractal considered to be for number five here a fractional again somewhere between the first and second dimension now list five different types of fractals and describe their basic characteristics so we're not going to describe their basic characteristics I just want to get across the point that there are lots of different types. Okay. And the important thing to remember about this is that fractals are usually grouped or defined by the model or process that they use to generate the fractal. Okay. So. The very first one was the Mandelbrot set. And so, in other words, if they use the recursive function that he defined, Mandelbrot, uh, then they're considered a Mandel fraction. Uh, Julia, Gaston Julia, had his own ideas about what fractals looked like um, in the early 1900s. And then, so he had uh, um, similar to what, you know, Mandelbrot had done. Uh, plasma fractals, again, are different. They actually use real valued functions to create these. And a Newton course was designed by um, these Newtonian methods. Uh, you can see all these different things. Um, IFS fractals are very popular. This is what they're called iterative fractal systems. And these are also created using real valued functions, but a system of real valued functions, not just like one function where you plug something in and you get this nice looking um, solution set out of it. So it's, it's a little bit more involved. Um, Lorenz fractals were generated from Lorenz attractors using differential equations and so on. So very mathematical, lots and lots of math. Um, you know, we could spend all semester talking about uh, all the different types of fractals and how they're generated and, and what they're being used for. So, all right. So, again, you can just list five of those different types. And then I just want to talk a few minutes about common uses. And I, I wrote here uh, studying coastlines generating landscapes, studying galaxies, polymers, uh, rivers, weather patterns, brains, uh, lots of fractals now in movies. And if you go and you look at um, 
the stuff that's out there. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. You can look at this first link uh, yourself and just see. And, and there's lots of interesting applications that people relate fractals to. So again, when you hear that, it's kind of like when we talked about the fourth dimension. A lot of people had their own ideas about what the fourth dimension is. And not everybody agrees on it. And that's okay. And as artists, we just want to understand that, first of all, people you know have different ideas about them. And we want to kind of understand a little bit about what those different ideas are in case we want to apply those and like you talk about fractal applications and cables and bridges and when you look at this you think well yeah it actually kind of is because it has this repetitive pattern the size is changing the shape are similar figures so it does have components of a true fractal image. So you see there's like a, a bigger circle and then they put these little circles you know, around that and then they're in circular shape and then you put these little circles around that and so on. And so, so we say, oh, that's a fractal image. Well, no, it's not, but it's fra very fractal-like, okay? So it has uh, some of the characteristics. So when you look at applications, you kind of have to uh, look into them a little bit and see, you know, what are they really talking about? Uh, and the um, applications, again, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these. I just want to make a few comments. So that you're kind of just better informed than you know, what, where you're at right now. That's the whole idea of this. Is I'm sure you've heard of fractals before, but I'm also sure there's a lot of it you really don't understand that exists in there because it's something that takes years of, of work uh, to really understand, you know, all the things and that they're involved in and all the math. But like, for example, here, creative solutions, a marketing solution, uh, that, I don't know what happened to the site, but that they were um, creating this. Come on, see. Okay, so this one here, I'm gonna skip. You can look at this. Was a painter, some some guys, you know, fractal paintings supposedly. Again, you got to be careful with the wording on what they're calling them, and you know, and. and uh, And all right, uh, here's another example, fractal antennas. And it was kind of interesting that, you know, Motorola played around with fractals and they uh, made some changes to their cell phone antennas and they used the fractal design uh, and ended up, you know, improving their efficiency by like 25%. So, you know, again, true fractals, no, fractal-like, yes, okay. So, but this stuff is, is really interesting, you know, that all the different areas that are looking into uh, fractals, okay. So, so if you like them and you have interest in them, you know, there's really a lot there for you to uh, go into so early fractal art well and you know i've been trying to stress the fact of fractal and fractal like okay. so if you talk about early fractal arts and you say fractal like things that were being created then this has been around for thousands of years okay where people would take and draw things change their positions make them smaller make them look exactly the same and make them smaller and smaller and position and changing and so on. So that, but when did fractal art, true fractal art start? Well, 1980, okay, 1980. And it had to deal with really 
uh, the idea of using a computer. To do true fractal images, you have to have a computer. Okay, there's no way around it. And I'll show you why. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't create stuff like this by hand, you know, or on uh, packages or so on. And this is really kind of a neat, you know, looking tree. And it's a very, very close to the fractal ideas that are out there. Uh, and they talk about, you know, fractal art here. Uh, this link, I'm not going to, uh, you can go into and look at this, but basically what this is saying is that, you know, even though fractals started, uh, you know, the images began to appear when we had computers, uh, that doesn't mean that just because you have a computer, you can create, you know, fractal art. You can create fractals very easily. There's free programs. We're going to look at some uh, and you're going to, you know, create some fractals very easily. Is that fractal art? Well, again, you know, everybody's got their opinion about what is really art. And so I don't want to, you know, say that anybody, you know, your opinions, that's your opinion. That's great. And um, but what I want you to understand, though, is that it, it takes work. It takes effort. It takes understanding. There's a lot more to it than punching a couple of numbers into a program. And then you pop something out and then you say, wow, this is fractal art. You know, I don't see it as that. I think it really takes a lot of work to come up with some really good stuff. And um, and that's kind of what was in this manifesto. And so number nine, when did fractals begin to appear in geometry and art? And again, 1980. You can look at, again, these links and see what they have to say or what you think about it. Um, this... Uh, Online fractal tools.com. So you can just see. Um, I put this in here. Let me see. And this is kind of a, a neat little site. And what you can go through is they show you all these different things that people are doing and creating, you know you know, draw a dendrite fractal. And it's just, you know, you can go in here and change the numbers and you get these nice little images. Again, this is just things that you could draw by hand. These are, these are using computers, but this is also, you could do this by hand, okay? So this is not what I mean by using a computer to draw images with, right? And then we saw that fractal tree earlier, and we said, okay, here's a canopy fractal. Well, you can draw this by hand, okay, also. This is great. I like the images. I think it's really cool, you know, to do this kind of stuff. Emphasizing the fact that we're not really there yet, okay? We're not quite there yet. Derek Nielsen, fractalage, he gets across the idea that, you know, the paintings by hand and so on, he's creating fractal-like images, okay? Uh, and on this Enterprises Wallpaper site, too, you can see some of that. What people are doing currently uh, by hand. Now, you know, we talked about the Fibonacci sequence and recursion, and we also did draw a true uh, theoretical fractal image, uh, kind of, right? <laughs> back when we were working with the golden ratio. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, let me put these down for a minute. Let's see if I can get over here. So uh, clear this out. Now remember, when we um, we did a golden rectangle, and again, this is going to be a very rough drawing. You guys know my drawing is not so great, but you try. Okay, so golden rectangle, right? Okay, so that looks like a parallelogram. 
Uh, and again, I have that snap. Let me just clear canvas. I was trying to get it to go from line to object. It's not interpreting it as good as I'd like. Okay. All right. Well, okay, not too bad. Now, what we did with this is we said, okay, let's say this is a golden rectangle. And then we said, okay, now if you draw a square here, then you're left with a golden rectangle here, which is a similar figure to the original one that we came up with, right? So it's similar. This is a golden rectangle. And then we draw another square in. It's smaller, right? But here's another golden rectangle. So we drew the square and it changed position. And this also changed with certain proportion, right? The, so the proportion remains constant. The shape is a self-similar figure. The position changed and it got smaller. So this actually follows all of the ideas of a true fractal image. And then we did that again and got that and we did it again. And this, theoretically, we said that the one interesting thing about the golden rectangle was it was the only geometric shape that could repeat this process on and on and on down to infinity. Okay. So we ended up seeing that the golden proportions, right, the golden rectangle was not only special in that way, but it also led us into this idea of um, that there's some kind of thing that we could get a visual or like a picture or something, but maybe not with real numbers. So this is a true fractal design also. All right, so let's, let's go back to uh, this and Okay, that was 11. All right, so good. Now, classroom assignment two. So classroom assignment two is kind of like what we just did with the golden rectangle. We, we took a geometric shape, repeated the pattern over and over, got smaller, and created a design like that. All right. Here's another example. What you're going to do is create a 2D image fractal-like image without a computer. So we want to do, and you could use, uh, if you want to use Illustrator or something like that or to draw, that's fine. We started with a circle, then we put circles inside to fill it up. And then we use more circles and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So changing position, size, shape, this recursive process that goes on into infinity. Here's one that we were playing with with that program. Here's another example. Square, and then this image built from that, and then you see it kind of got smaller, and then gave you that kind of design. Another one here using diamond shapes. Smaller and smaller. So these are all geometrically based fractal-like images. So kind of that was being done a lot. You know, when we talk about fractal art, this has been around for a long time, okay? People drawing these things by hand. And I just noted here, right? Um, let's look at an extension now of, and uh, you know, again, you know, here's what people were doing for a long time, like this. And then uh, here's current day. This, um, let's, let me just bring this up here. Okay. Okay. 
So this is from the American Mathematical Society. Now this is a, uh, Ann Burns is a mathematician who likes to, and, and again, kind of like, you know, myself, again, I'm basically a mathematician, but just, I just really enjoy working with imaging and creating, you know, computer generated images based off mathematical rules and so on. So, so I like this stuff. And, um, but all of her work is based in uh, mathematical models, all right? So again, these are some really neat stuff that she was able to generate based off of math. So for example, they says here, this, these are uh, derivatives. So they take the derivative of this x squared minus y squared, the real and imaginary parts of the complex function, f of z equals z squared, and then they um, direct along the tangent vectors, and then they come up with these here. And so if you're really into the math and you like the math part of it, this is a good website. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of mathematicians really enjoy being able to visually see different types of solution sets. And that's really what these are. These are solution sets to mathematical models. And you can create some really, really neat stuff uh, with this, okay, and so on. So a lot, of, a lot of good works. You can look at Ann Burns' site. And there's lots of other things at the AMS that you can go into and see. You know, they've been, um, they've been doing this for a while now. I, you know, probably since the, uh, you know, again, I'd say 1980s um, on till now. All right, so, uh, all right, let's get into it. And finally, after all this, after all this talk and all this time, right, we haven't even really looked at a fractal yet, a real fractal. Now, who's the father of fractals? Uh, by far, everybody, I think, would agree that the person that created that very first fractal image, ben, Benoit Mandelbrot, okay? And what type of number was used to create the Mandelbrot set? It was, they were complex numbers, okay? And uh, let's go ahead and look at that image. So this was the very first fractal image. Oops, right here. And that's, you know, very famous. It always will be. Uh, and the black, okay, the black is the solution set. So in algebra, when you create a solution set, you're used to like linear functions and you just get a straight line. And that's the visual representation of the solution set. Uh, you get a circle or you get a curvy line. And that's the, now what was so interesting about these is you notice that they're regions, they're not lines, right? They're, they're actually regions and this, all the black, all these points are in the solution to the Mandelbrot set. Okay, so the set is really a collection of points. And this is the Mandelbrot collection of points that satisfies the complex valued recursive function that he created, right? And you say, May, okay, that's that's interesting and uh, that's neat, but okay, that seems like, is that it? But no, this is was really just how, this is where it started at 1980. And now we've had lots of people work, you know, at stuff over the past, you know, 40 years. So, uh, so it's starting to really grow pretty rapidly. Now, plot the points. To plot complex number points, uh, you plot them just like as if the i wasn't there. So this is 3, 4. So you would go, you'd go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So x direction first, y direction. This is called the real part and then the imaginary part, but it's just like the xy plane. Negative two, negative six would be negative two, negative one, two, three, four, five, six, it'd be down in here, okay? 
5 comma 0, you would go over 5 and 0, up or down, and so on. So, so these plot very simply, just like we plot ordered pairs in the xy plane. Okay. What is the test equation for the Mandelbrot set? Test equation. Okay. So it's actually pretty simple. Uh, let me just close. Okay. Okay. Z sub n equal z sub n minus 1 squared plus c. Now, here's what happens. Here's how you get the solution set. This image, you have to test every single point on the screen. Okay. Remember, the computer screen is just made up of a bunch of points, right? It really is not an infinite number of points. So if you look at your resolution, right, you look at the screen resolution, you know, you got like different resolutions, right? It was always like 640 by 480 when they started. And so they'd give you a couple hundred, 300,000 points were on the screen. And now they're up to, you know, 1920 by 1260 or something. I can't remember all the numbers, but, you know, there's millions of points on the screen nowadays, but still a finite number of points. And Mandelbrot said, well, I'm going to take and test every single point on that screen. And he knew real numbers were not going to help him. So he worked with complex numbers. So C represents a point off the complex plane that we were just talking about, that A plus B I, right? So this would be one point. So it would just be like, okay, I'm going to test that point right there. That's some A plus B I, you know, complex number. And take whatever these values are, plug it right in here. Then I would take and square it, add it to this, put it back in. I'd get an answer here. Then I would take that number, whatever I got, put it back in here and square it. Add it to the exact same number, okay? It's the same number. This number changes all the time because I square it, I put it over here, I add it to this, put it over here. Whatever this becomes, I put it in here. Square it, add it to this exact same number. You do this recursive process. So that's where the recursion comes in. Now, how many times do you do that? Well, if the number if this value, okay, z sub n gets greater than 2, not in solution set. If z sub n stays less than 2 in the solution set. Now that means you got to do this like 50 times, 100 times, 200 times before you're sure of this, that z sub n never gets greater than 2. Because see, once it gets greater than 2, it's never coming back. When a complex number starts to get large, it'll get very large. When a complex number stays small, less than, it'll always stay small. No matter how many times we ran this thing, it would stay. So we have to set the number of uh, iterations that would occur. And then we got to test every point. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of iterations for one image. That's why it took months and months and months for Mandelbrot to even get an image. He was getting frustrated. He was ready to quit because he didn't come up with anything. And computers then were so slow uh, that we're really, I mean, it's even slow now still for some of the stuff, but, um, so, uh, so that's kind of the idea. It, it's really, uh, was kind of interesting and they theorized it actually Greg Cantor back in the 1800s theorized this idea. Julia, Gaston Julia, um, he wrote about it and he kind of mathematically said it would work. And then Mandelbrot got himself a computer 
and actually was able to show that it works. Okay, so what value of the test equation is plotted? The C, the C that we just looked at there, okay, the C. The, uh, what determines how points are colored in the Mandelbrot set? Uh, how many iterations you have to go through before it goes greater than two? So you take and you run this thing through over and over and over, and then all of a sudden it shoots off. You count those iterations, you apply a color to it. So a lot of people really got into the different types of colorings, and, and it came out pretty neat. And let's look at this. Control C. All right. So, so, and there's a picture of a man abroad. Uh, but it says create your own wildly colorful fractal using our generator. So this is another, this is a very simple, um, and again, I don't know if this will even run. Let me just see if you notice the coloring, right? You can apply different colors and people colored this man abroad set. Uh, and then, uh, this is very important about why I talked about you have to have a computer uh, to, to do the Mandelbrot set, but uh, let's see if this works. Okay, it's not going to work. That's right. We got another one we can use. Uh, so we're going to get rid of that one. And... Um, what people started to do was zoom in on those um, edges of the nano rod set to see what was going on. Okay. So again, what they did is they they looked around here around the edges and they started to zoom in okay. and see, and that's truly what's unique about the Mandelbrot set. So here's, there's a lot of videos out there about Mandelbrot zooms. And, uh, but they're infinite and their image changes. So they don't maintain, so they're not self-similar. They do have some similar, um, and again, here's a, it says this is a deep zoom. <coughs> and let's try to get this thing going. So, Again, what they're doing, and this is what people did for years to try to come up with fractal kind of designs. So they're zooming in, you'll see, on a part of that solution set. And what will happen is, is, and again, these are solutions, but now the set will change. So in other words, the image will change which means the solution set is changing. So it maintains a certain shape, and I'm gonna uh, speed this up a little bit. And then here's another change. So if you see, now you have a, a kind of a neat image here, all right? And then you can go deeper into the Mandelbrot set, and now you have another image. And you can do that just infinitely. Here you have another solution set. This is impossible to do with anything other than complex numbers and impossible to do by hand. Um, that's what makes them really unique, okay? Uh, the changes and... Um, so it kept people busy for a long time, and people still use the Mandelbrot set. And I want to get to the end just to show you um, something that's kind of neat. Uh, if, 
But you'll notice at the very end, when they zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in and it kept changing and changing and changing, what kind of came out? Uh, and it kind of went back to the original Mandelbrot set. So the self-similar idea, but much, much more intriguing. Uh, okay, so, and that's only one, uh, one uh, fractal. The Mandelbrot set is only one. There's lots of them out there. Again, so let me get out of that. So this stuff is endless. All right, uh, parametric design. Again, you can read that. I'm going to skip that. It's just something that you read. You know, the difference between direct and parametric modeling. The only thing I wanted to get out of this is that when you use fractals to design something, you're using parametric modeling. You know, you have something, some type of foundation already that exists, and then you're going to modify that. So you're not creating something from scratch by yourself. You know, some more direct modeling ideas would be, okay, you start with kind of nothing and then you just build everything. But the parametric modeling idea is that we have parameters that we have to stay within. In complex numbers, especially, uh, you can't, it's almost impossible to build um, just randomly or throw this stuff together and then come up with your own unique um, fractal image. There's, there's parameters that you have to stay within and processes and rules to be able to get this stuff to work. Now, this a classroom assignment three, and uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm watching the time. I know I've almost gone for an hour here, but there's so much to talk about. Uh, classroom assignment three, this XAOS, I'm going to open it up and uh, you can go to Fractal Foundations here, this link. And it's a little, it's organizational, it's safe. It's just a little tiny program. Or you could find something else that you want to use. But, okay, so when you open it up, it just looks like this. So you'll see it's just a little interesting kind of program. And I wanted you to get that feel for creating a design the way they used to back in the 1980s, 1990s, when this stuff first started. So XAOS is a nice little program. And um, what you do is you just point and click. I just point, say this, and I'm going to uh, kind of pick a design and and I'm going to move this thing around and get it kind of in the middle. And, and you know, so there's kind of a design based off of the Mandelbrot set. And you could kind of zoom in more on this point, or you could change where you want to zoom in at. And eventually it'll, you know, get start to look different. So that's starting to look a little bit different there. And so maybe I like that better, you know. Uh, and so on. So that is really the Mandelbrot set. Now, let's say uh, for assignment three, then you have to do another one that's not a Mandelbrot set. So, you know, Mandelbrot sets is, is great, but there's lots of other ones out there. Let's go to Fractal, User Formula, or More. So let's go to More Formula. You can type in your own if you have the formulas, but let's go to, I don't even know what this is, Triceratops. We'll look at it. So that kind of doesn't look very exciting. Uh, let's see. That one. Eh, let's try another one. Uh, fractal formula. Let's go to the Phoenix. All right. So that's kind of neat. That's neat. And you can uh, use that. So let's look at that. And maybe you find a design in there. And so is that all there is to fractals? No, no, not at all. But this is, again, this, you know, a lot of people use this stuff and try to create their own fractals. And you notice that, you know, there's formulas. Uh, 
there's more formulas here. There's all these different, you know, kinds that you can look at. All right. So that's classroom assignment three. It's pretty basic. You're just going to create a couple images. Programs here and some other links you can look at. So as far as a real world application, if you're thinking about a project, you can use those. Like, for example, here's one. Where somebody just used it as a background to a um, menu or like a nice t shirt design. So, pretty cool looking, just a basic fractal image, you know, complex number fractal. Now, uh, that, you know, after a while, people kind of got tired of that. And, and, you know, it seemed like you could only do so much with those ideas because the big key with complex numbers is lack of control. So if you want some more control, then you can try this program that was written, uh, I think 2004 is when it came out as freeware. And um, a lot of people contribute to Apophysis. So um, this is one of those ones that started as a, uh, a school project. And I don't remember if it was MIT, the students were at MIT or somewhere, and they decided to write this program. But what they did, and it really was exceptional ideas, but what they did is they took real valued functions. So this iterative function or fractional system um, took sets of um, real value functions to create fractal like images but there was control we have control over what we want the images to look like with real value functions okay so i'm just going to show you that they're similar and just go to you can download it i've downloaded it i have it on my computer i've never had any issues with it um Whoops, wrong one. Here we go. Now you'll notice the difference, uh, slight differences between what we were looking at before and say something like this, where this definitely has more structure to it. The other stuff was kind of crazy and all over the place. Well, Apophysis, what they did is it, it looks very fractal-like. And, but it, it's also, it got some nice structure to it. So you can create images that, you know, you may want this. That's something that you may want. Uh, like, here's another example. So you want to build a neat kind of cool-looking fractal-like flower or lily pad thing or something uh, that's capable. Would, there, would you be able to find this? in a true complex number fractal you know function well maybe but you might have to look for a week through a bunch of stuff where uh you know because you got to zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom and then you got to change and all that and you know where this it's a whole lot easier to come up with the neat stuff like this so so a lot of people jumped on board to apophysis apophysis is the most used fractal software in the world right now. And, and it, it may be changing though because of some other ones I'm gonna show you that come out. So it even got better. But you could design like a necktie or something on an image with Apophysis. Um, and number 21, I'm gonna uh, just kind of skip past us because I'm. we don't really have to do much with this. This guy I just put in there because this guy, they call him the bug man, but he's another uh, very, very well uh, versed. He has very good background in mathematics, high level math, and he creates images uh, like Ann Burns does. Uh, his are all very, oh, he, he writes really well in um, Mathematica and creates a lot of programs. So he has a good math and programming background. And, and so if you get a chance to look at his site, it's, it's really neat. Um, now, 
So what was next? So we had uh, apophysis. We started to get better imaging. So then people started to think about we can take real value ideas and generate, again, fractal-like images. So whether you call them fractals or not, uh, they're not complex numbers. They're, this idea of textures and landscapes was kind of like the next thing out there. And they were calling them like plasma fractals, but they were very geometric. And there was a geometric iterative process to how they were created. But they were created in um, a, a different way. So people were looking mathematics. There was new math being generated. There were new images being generated. There's an incredibly strong link between math and visuals with these ideas, fractal-like ideas, not just fractals, but all these ideas. For example, uh, creating textures in like After Effects. So if you go in After Effects, you look up noise and you can find like fractal noise, all right? And here's one of the very simple ones that'll come up. You can go in again and, and go into uh, fractal noise. And you got some controls over here. And this is uh, just basic shapes and um, uh, some layering. There's like three or a couple layers here. But what they did is use the idea of like, you know, um, Photoshop or something like that. But um, this started out with just squares, simple squares, okay, bigger squares, and they were placed on the screen, okay. Then they took smaller squares and randomly placed those across the screen, right, and then took smaller squares. And then so this random element was implemented and used. So the next big thing in fractals had to deal with the idea of randomization and what they refer to as Brownian fractals. So these were created solely with random number generators and they were linked to um, certain geometric shapes and they were simple shapes, but they came up with very nice textures and you can do smoothing and transformations and make them look like clouds or lakes, uh, mountain ranges. You can, you know, do all that. So it really uh, started to become very popular. And then uh, we even had more development because they said, hey, uh, why couldn't we just build the whole landscape with this fractal-like idea? And you'll see these fractal train generators. And um, I'll pull one up here in a minute. But um, the you notice really the combination of what this is here. You know, these are just line illusions. In the last unit, we talked about illusions and how important, you know, understanding line illusions was. And then now we're starting to see more applications of line illusions because that's all these are, right? That's all these are. And so we can get this idea of building a mountain into a landscape or anything actually uh, with randomness and this idea of these Brownian fractals and how they were created. And you'll see here in Maya, uh, you know, there's functions in Maya where you can use that to create these designs and then also to texture those images, you know, in, in 3D like images and so on. And uh, so, so they're being used in lots and lots of different ways. Now, um, I want to get to classroom assignment four, you know, create a landscape design with After Effects, or you can just do a simple line illusion like this. And this gives you the idea of how are fractal images generated with this um, Brownian method or with this, uh, what they call 
a, um, and I think it was up here, uh, diamond square algorithm. Here it is. You can look that up or put a link up there. They actually go and show you how, you know, you come up with something like this using simple bisection methods and probability placements. But this can be just by hand, something very simple. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I put a link here for all these different types of fractal generating programs. If you're interested, these are all the new ones that are out there. And before I get to that last one, let me see if uh, um, there's entire programs uh, that base themselves off of that. And the, the Terragen, let me see if I can... Pull this up. <laughs> uh, all right, so Terragen is probably one of the more popular ones out there right now. Again, these are these are generated using uh, this idea of you know just fractals, fractals, and uh, and I'm going to kind of skip ahead, but you can see how they're creating these mountains in there. And I wanted to get... Um, one with more... Uh, The World Creator too was a, a, a new one. Um, uh, okay, so I'm not getting any luck on um, what I was looking for, but that's okay. You guys can play around with that and see. Um, I just wanted to just show you, uh, it, it's pretty good, pretty clean, really nice looking stuff. So I just, if you pick some of these uh, images to look at, okay, so so really pretty good. I mean, I, I think it looks great. And this software has come a long way. I, I remember it when it first came out and I, it was a free version. I downloaded and played around with it and watched it kind of grow over the years. And you can still download this version free. Of course, you don't get all the fancy features with it, but you can still do really neat stuff with it. So the TerraGen 4, again, is one of the best ones out there for doing, um, you know, landscape design, things like that. And it imports into Maya and so on. Um, and like even the lakes and stuff, I think they do a really good job. And it keeps getting better and better. Okay, so let's get back to finishing this up. And we're, we're not even done yet talking about what's happening and, and what's out there. But I'm going to do just a, a, you can read about 3D fractals. And I want you to understand that uh, 3D fractals are not generated like we generate 3D in mathematics and real in you know with real valued functions. Uh, you know we have x axis and x and y axis in two dimensions, and then we just throw in the x y z axis, and we can get you know 3D effects. 
Uh, and we can model that in mathematics very easily. Well, you can't do that with um, complex numbers. It just doesn't work. And so what they do is they slice. So it's kind of like imaging. It's like, you know, MRI when you get an MRI done. Or if you do a um, printer, you know, the 3D printers, they, they compute slices and they build it that way and put it together. And that's how they create. And this Mandelbulb 3D is um, the Mandelbulb 3D is one of the ones that people look at the most. Of course, it's after, named after the Mandel Abrat set. Mandelbulb uh, 3D. And so let's go ahead and look at one of these because this is uh, really, really has um, just continued to grow incredibly. Uh, so you see the kind of images that you can get with the Mandelbrot set. So they took the Mandelbrot set and you can see you zoom in, the same thing occurs, it'll keep changing. And these images are really massively computer intensive, you know, calculation intensive. Uh, they put them together with two dimensional and just layering and layering and layering. Uh, on one on top of the other to to get this to show and so you can come up with some pretty neat stuff and so I'm just going to kind of flip through here so you guys can uh, you know they talk about this in, in the program and so on so actually that program is free also uh, and then, okay, so then the further development, two different types of hybrid fractals. So you can have hybrid fractals where you take, say, a Mandelbrot recursive function and combine it with a Newtonian, say, fractal image. And you put two complex um, e equations together and then you create a mixture of those two, okay? So that's one way you can create hybrid fractals. Another way is to take uh, a complex equation and then link it into real valued functions to create different types of really neat images and stuff. And there's a lot of links here you can look at on those two. And, and it just keeps, it's again, this is something that would take us, you know, years to go through in depth. But I, I really wanted to show you because it's probably the biggest uh, combination of the volume of mathematics that's linking to all these different types of images that are being, you know, used in different fields, not just in art, but all kind of fields we talked about, like architecture and physiology and radiology and imaging, brain imaging, things like that. It's, 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 this stuff is being used uh, in chaos theory uh, with air, air dynamics and airplanes and things like that. It's, it's, it's uh, really a very incredibly interesting field of study. So, so again, uh, hopefully uh, I, I talked enough to get you through the assignments. Again, if not, we'll be meeting again, and I'll answer all your questions for you then. So uh, I really went overboard on this one, but there was so much uh, here to talk about, even just the big picture, uh, that I didn't want to leave anything out because it's a very exciting uh, field. So um, we will see you guys, and uh, I'm going to end this <laughs> finally.